Welcome back to CCTV's News Bulletin, with many interesting topics. Not one, but two interviews with authority and industry experts. One on the PFAS regulations and another one on safe and sustainable by design. Furthermore, a statement related to sustainable products. And to start with, some takeaways from Tosca Tuesday. We had two excellent sessions this morning on implementation of Tosca. Headlined by Michal Friedhoff from EPA, Madison Lee from EPA and Dave Turk from EPA. We covered issues ranging from new chemical notification issues under Section 5, the Section 6 implementation and the promulgation of final rules for a number of chemicals. And Dave Turk talked uh, in some detail about the new Section uh, 8A7 PFAS reporting rule, although we couldn't provide details because we're between the proposed and final rule stage. Uh, there's much talk about the challenges faced by the agency due to the lack of resources and funding issues, uh, but uh, certainly Madison Lee was very confident that with some recent hires and some time, the agency would be able to work down some of the backlog that exists in the Section 5 PMN process. After Tom's recap on Tosca Tuesday, let's go to Pierre. Hi man, where are you? I'm at San Francisco's City Hall, completed in 1915 and replacing the previous City Hall which opened in 1899. Of course, the original one was destroyed in the 1906 earthquake. Earthquakes were the topic of yesterday's fortune cookie, correct? Absolutely. Tell us more about earthquakes and San Francisco. I'd love to, but first, let me show you a bit more about San Francisco's City Hall, a historic and iconic building which was built in the Beaux Arts fashion, the school in Paris. And for those of you who have been to Paris, you'll also notice a striking similarity with the Invalids building, the Saint Louis des Invalides. Both feature a grand dome with gold on top. San Francisco City Hall has a grand dome which actually rises nine feet higher than the US Capitol in Washington, DC. To be prepared for earthquakes, San Francisco City Hall has undergone a number of seismic retrofit measures to help ensure its safety during earthquakes. Some of these measures include the installation of steel braces and supports in the building's basement, the addition of steel beams to reinforce the building's roof, and the installation of a tuned mass damper to help counteract the effect of seismic activity. These measures help to ensure that City Hall remains a safe and iconic building for future generations to enjoy. But back to the 1906 earthquake. It was one of the most destructive earthquakes in history. The earthquake struck San Francisco on the morning of April 18, 1906, and caused widespread damage and destruction. More than 3,000 were killed, and more or less 55% of the population became homeless, and more than 28,000 buildings were destroyed. So roughly 90% of the city was destroyed, and that could have been much more. The hero in this story is a fire hydrant at the corner of Mission Dolores Park. The 1906 earthquake destroyed much of the city's water lines, and in the resulting fire, hydrant after hydrant was tested, but not a drop of water would be found. At the last moment though, someone discovered a working hydrant, this one at the corner of Mission Dolores Park. And indeed for a number of days, it served as the primary source of water for San Francisco firefighters. Nowadays, it's spray painted gold in recognition of its role in saving the city, the determination of San Franciscans, and also basically marks how far the fire spread. What a tragedy. So San Francisco as we know it today is more or less a young, vibrant, one century old city? Is it? Are we at risk for another major earthquake or...? Uh... There's always a risk of living here in a seismically active region of the San Andreas Fault, the tectonic boundary between the Pacific Plate and the North American Plate. Bigger earthquakes are expected to occur every 200 years, but in the meantime, smaller ones can also take place. In 1989, for example, the San Francisco Loma Prieta earthquake destroyed a portion of the Oakland Bay Bridge near the Financial District. Mind you, a district very vulnerable to earthquakes because it's built literally on top of landfill and old ships. Old ships that were, in gold rush times, abandoned, oftentimes by crew members who would instead buy a shovel, leave for the hills, and leave San Francisco in a rush of gold. For a chance, here's a fortune cookie. Let's meet there and I'll tell you the story about Shanghai Kelly, who found a very creative solution of to get new crew for these ships. Curious, lead by example and others will follow. Whispers in the alleyway lead to the door of secrecy. One can enter, but only if you know the key. Okay, I will follow you, but it might take a while. Therefore, please watch the impression of two interviews. First, the interview I had with Richard Luyt and Magdalena Mihova on PFAS restriction, an other kind of earthquake that rocked the world. If we look at the next steps and deadlines for the authorities, uh, can you clarify that? 
The original submission was planned for summer uh, last year and it was uh, the, the extended for half a year uh, because the dossier was so complex and we needed much more time to evaluate the information we got from all the uh, uh, consultations. Uh, so uh, it took us half, half a year longer to submit the dossier in the end in January. Uh, and now uh, what will happen next is that the scientific committees at ECHA will uh, look at the proposal. It was uh, uh, submitted to them and they have to decide first on conformity. Uh, last week we presented the dossier in ECHA uh, at the Socioeconomic Analysis Committee and the next step this week will be that it's presented in the Risk Assessment Committee as well. After that we expect to be in conformity and then the uh, so-called uh, public consultation on the uh, Annex 15 dossier will start. Uh, that runs for six months until September this year. Um, and uh, I think that is very important. It's a reaching out again to get more information on the uses, more information on the volumes, on alternatives. And another important uh, point to mention is that on the 5th of April there will be an information session uh, organized by the European Chemicals Agency. And for those companies without the information, eh, uh, so they're basically trapped between the devil and the deep blue sea, are there any derogation prospects or is it game over? It depends on the context. So those uh, applications where derogation is not submitted, it is also or could be that uh, industry did not participate, but in some cases it is due to the complexity of the proposal or probably the lack of awareness that uh, the consultations pro uh, were already running prior to the proposal submission. So some industries, they still have the wake-up call to catch up and then do a sprint, not a marathon, and submit data. Um, probably that could lead to some additional derogations. It is not uh, only the case of companies that could not provide quality data. Uh, also, uh, the, in some cases, alternatives have been shown to exist. Now, um, probably alternatives could be a viable option for certain application, not for all. So we may also expect during that process that those uh, industries who cannot actually uh, apply the suggested alternative to their own application could come with data and analysis of alternatives from their point of view and explain that viable alternatives do not yet exist. So options are still out there depending on the case. I'm at the Barrel Room to meet with Pierre in the so-called speakeasy that illegally operated in the 1920s, in the era of prohibition when the sale and consumption of alcoholic beverages was outlawed. A speakeasy was a great invention a century ago when you needed a drink. But in our era we have bigger challenges. Please watch the impression of the interview I had with Josef Wunsch and Jürgen Tietje for safe and sustainable by design. What are for the two of you, the ambitions and expectations for the SSBD? For me, first, it should be an international reference point where Europe stands. Citizens are, in Europe are very interested and even very concerned about safety and environment. We should never underestimate this. Maybe citizens and other economies of the world think differently. Uh, that's the first point. On the other hand, I would say it's important that we have a common understanding what we mean by this. I don't want to end up with the Tower of Babel. So we have so many languages and no one knows, knows actually what we're talking about because citizens will expect this. From my perspective, um, we have to really, when it comes down to safety, that should be somehow related to reach. It should be co yeah, put into reach, maybe just separated. And then the sustainability part should give the guiding principle how to develop alternatives. Um, whatever is out there to be changed, and we will see that in a few months, um, we need guiding rails, what is in and what is out, what is considered as sustainable. Again, I would not put too much emphasis on, on the early phase, uh, a staggered approach, step by step, uh, accumulating data, let's make it pragmatic, Let's make it an innovation tool. Let's make it a business case for Europe. Please watch a complete interview on our YouTube channel. Pierre, tell us everything about Shanghai Kelly. My pleasure. So early San Francisco had quite a poor fresh water supply. And so alcohol became a welcome substitute. And naturally, saloons became the early social centers of town. 
But these saloons also became the site of something a bit more mysterious, something called Shanghaiing. You see, we mentioned earlier that sailors would arrive in San Francisco and often go for the hills, abandon their crew, and try to strike it rich in the mines. And so these captains with understaffed ships, they now had to find more, well, creative ways of finding new crew. And they turned to the bar owners of San Francisco, asking them, can you find me new employees for my ship? I'm not going to ask any difficult questions. Shanghaiing becomes the practice of kidnapping your own clientele within your bar. The most notorious of these bar owners, his name was Shanghai Kelly, a fiery Irishman. He was known for leading new early, newly arrived sailors into his bar with the promise of a free drink, which turned out to be laced with opium or laudanum. It's said that his saloon had a trap door, and when an unsuspecting sailor had too much to drink, Shanghai's henchmen would pull the trapdoor lever for him to fall down two flights of stairs, be robbed, tied up, and then thrown onto a ship for him to never see the coastline of California again. After a while, a lot of these patrons, well, they would be more wary of accepting free drinks, and they'd want to choose their own seating, naturally. And so Shanghai Kelly changed tactics, offering his victims a laced cigar before knocking them out and dragging them onto his ship. And sometimes it wasn't even that complicated. His most famous exploit, kidnapping 100 people in one night by throwing a party on a boat and offering free whiskey to the first 100 arrivals. Within a few minutes, no one was able to resist being knocked unconscious. Cheers. Wow. Cheers. Uh, to, talking about a party, tonight is our social event. Uh, let's have a beer there together. And maybe you can tell us many more San Francisco stories. Wait, I have another fortune cookie for you. There you go. Life is a journey, not a destination. Climb hills, descend with ease, through the city streets with a gentle breeze. Also, tonight's event is more about the journey than the destination. But to where? You'll figure it out. But before I get Shanghai here, I jump back to the studio for the statement of the day. Shanghaiing. Many people seem to collaborate in these tricky schemes. Also, sustainable products needed collaboration. That's something I will discuss with John Falk of Opisus. John, welcome, and I hope your seat is comfortable. Uh, thank you. It, it is, and feeling fairly stable, too. Very good. John, why do sustainable products need collaboration? Well, you know, regulations are getting increasingly more complex and requiring more and more information. You know, maybe from your suppliers and your suppliers, suppliers all the way down to a raw material. And data needs to be shared through manufacturing, through distribution into consumers, and ultimately end of use and recycling. Uh, so it's really important that we all collaborate together to hopefully make our products more sustainable. So your statement is? We all need to collaborate to make products safer and more sustainable. Thank you very much, John, for your statement. Looking forward to seeing you tonight at our social event. And now it's time for the focus of today. Our spotlight this morning is on Europe, with EU's chemical strategy for sustainability and the REITS and COP revision. In the afternoon, REITS authorization and restriction experiences and sustainability in the value chain. Thank you for watching and enjoy today and tonight.